Well, good morning. My name is Steve Heimler, in case you don't know me. I'm one of the preachers here, and I'm very grateful to be with you. Now, uh, with respect to that passage, um, it reminded me of something, which is going to sound not related at all, but just stick with me for a second. Uh, years ago, I read a story about a Korean man who um, was working in Korea's financial sector, and he would get up every morning, he would put on a really sharp suit and tie, and then he would go to work early, and he would work all day, come home, say hello to his family, and that's how his days would go. And then a recession hit Korea, and he um, lost his job. And so the next day after he lost his job, he woke up early like he did every other morning. He put on that same suit and tie, and he left the house. But instead of going to a job, which he did not have anymore, he walked the trails all day long in a national park that was close to his house, and then he came home and said hello to his family like he did every night and pretended as though everything was exactly the same. And he did this for months. He got up, wore his suit, left, walked the trails of that national park all day long, came home when he would normally come home from work, and he never told his family that he had lost his job. Now, if you hear that story um, and you, the first thing that comes up in you is sort of like incredulous disbelief, um, then it might be because you don't understand and that we as a culture don't understand the thing that's actually going on below that. Like, why wouldn't he tell his family that he lost his job? Why in the world would he go off and create this charade all day long for months until he finally lost all of his money and ha was forced to confess? Why would he do such a thing? Well, on our computers, there is something called an operating system, and that operating system is like the fundamental, foundational software that exists on that computer, and every other program uh, can only be run if that operating system is going on. So um, in Asian cultures, in Korean cultures, and for the most part in Asian cultures and, and Eastern cultures, the operating system that runs the whole thing is something called honor and shame culture. And so, um, and so if you don't understand this man's um, behavior, it's likely that we don't understand the honor and shame culture. Now, um, just by way of definition, honor is means something like weight. <clears throat> it means something like weight. And um, truthfully, it means something like the cultural values of the community. Um, the community then bestows honor upon a person who conforms to those cultural values. So honor in that society means weight. On the other hand, shame means something like to esteem a person lightly, okay? So for those who conform to the communal values, they are bestowed with honor. For those who do not and um, act in ways contrary to the cultural norms, they are bestowed with shame. Now, in an honor-shame culture, there are essentially two kinds of honor. The first is ascribed honor, and the second is achieved honor. Now, ascribed honor is the kind of honor that you receive because you were born into a particular family. You have uh, a particularly honorable family, and they have a name, and just by virtue of being uh, attached to that name, you have a particular set of honorable values in that society. The other is achieved honor, and that honor is the kind that you uh, receive because of the things that you achieve, the, the way that you behave in accordance with the cultural norms of that particular uh, society. So there's ascribed honor and there's achieved honor. Now, understanding that, uh, you begin to understand why this man would leave his house every day and do what he did. Because in that particular culture, to work, to provide for one's family, it's a sense of honor. To not have a, to, to not have a way to um, provide for your family, a, you, you have shame. And so that's why he did what he did. However, we don't live in that kind of culture. Right? We, we don't have an honor-shame culture. If you grew up in America, that, that's not the operating system that we have. Now, I'm not going to go into what op operating system we do have, but that's beside the point. But regardless, we, we know what it means to long for honor. Like We know what that means. Even if we didn't grow up in that kind of society, we, we long for honor. We pine for the kind of recognition that comes from the community that says, you are valuable. You, you mean something to us. You matter to us. We long for that, even though 
we don't live in an honor shame culture. Like, haven't you ever been part of um, a project or something at work, and um, you, you just you longed for the people that you worked with or the people that you delivered to to look at you and say, "Well done. You, th th this was wonderfully executed. Thank you." We long for that kind of recognition. Or, or how about all the moms that are at home right now? Um, during quarantine, trying to make their children, uh, trying to organize their children's lives in a way that they thrive and in a way that they not only survive, but actually flourish during this time. And at the end of the day, after the long hours of pouring out and sacrifice that those mothers put in, nobody honors them. I mean, not least the children. I, I mean, uh, or, or th the point is, we all long for this kind of thing. Like, like we want in our heart of hearts, somebody to look at us. So the people of our community with whom we share values, we want them to look at us. We want them to say, I see you. You're valuable to me. And the thing is, our society, we spend an awful lot of energy. We spend an awful lot of time trying to convince ourselves that what other people think about us doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. It only matters what I think about myself. It doesn't matter what the wider society values me. I value me. And the thing, and I understand where that comes from, um, but it's not altogether helpful because there's something inside of us. No, it doesn't matter how many times I say, it doesn't matter what other people think. There's still something inside of me that wants people to value me, that wants to know that I am valuable, but from the outside. Because every time I tell myself that, right after, there's a little voice that comes up inside that says, are you sure? Like, really? So that brings us, uh, with all of that foundation laid, that brings us to the passage uh, that Meredith read for us today. It comes from Philippians chapter 2. And just to make sure that we are all on the same page, let, let me go back to what uh, Paul has done all throughout this chapter. So he opened the chapter by expositing for us the chief virtue that should befit the Christian community, which is to say humility. And he defined that humility as uh, people who place the needs of others before their own needs, people who count others more significant than themselves. Then he gave us the exemplar of humility, which is to say Jesus Christ. He was the one who left glory, came down, um, and humiliated himself all the way down to death on a cross, and then was highly exalted so that his name would be above every other name, and at his name, every, every people should bow on heaven, in heaven and on earth. And then he said that we, as the church, as we become the kinds of people who manifest that kind of humility, both within our own community and without our community, um, on the outside of our community, we will become as lights that shine in the world. Now, that brings us to the passage that we have today. And it seems like, he, I mean, Paul has been soaring uh, in the heavens for, you know, 18 verses, uh, talking about what humility means, talking about the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and showing us what this manifestation of humility within the community, community could be. And then it's like he gets down into some church administration. Like, he wants to introduce a couple of guys. He wants to make sure that they, they are received and that sort of thing. But if you understand everything that I was saying about honor and shame, you'll realize that church administration, that is not what he's doing right now. So let, let's see what uh, he says. First, about Timothy. He's going to introduce us to two men, Timothy and Epaphroditus. So first Timothy in verse 19. Listen to what Paul says. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare, for they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth. How as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also." So that's Timothy. Did you see what he did there? He's not just, he's not just giving some, us some administrative minutia. What he's saying is, look at him. He is the kind of man who puts the needs of others in front of his own, and you know his proven worth. That's what honor means. It means the worth of somebody in the midst of a community. And so he says, look at this man. He is the exemplar 
of humility, and we are placing him in front of you. That's what honor means, to take somebody publicly and hold them in front of the community and say, look at him, look at her, look at the way they honor Christ. Look at the way they conform to the humility, in this case, of Christ. Okay, now he's going to do it with Epaphroditus. Verse 25, I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So here's Epaphroditus, a man who risked his life for the sake of the gospel to carry the support from the Philippian church to Paul who was in prison. And so he said he puts Epaphroditus now in front of the congregation. And what are we supposed to do with these two men? What are the Philippians supposed to do with these two men? That's what we see in verse 29. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. What do we do with people in the community who are honorable? Paul says, honor them. Take the values, the worth that we have all been taught by the scriptures and add weight to those people in the community. The What is honorable deserves to be honored. So take these people, take these men, take these women, take these children, place them in front of the community and say, and and honor them, add weight to them. Now imagine the kind of community that we would be if we were able to do these kinds of things, if we were able to honor one another in front of the whole community. Like we were able to take the people who serve us and do what Paul is doing right here and place them in front of each other and say, you are worth honor. You, you are worthy in our eyes. You are valuable to us precisely because you manifest the humility of Christ. Like think, think of what it would be to take these mothers who are pouring themselves out and fathers as well, who are pouring themselves out for their children right now and hold them up and say, we see you, and the work that you're doing is God's work. We thank you for it. Or, or, or think about the, the people who serve us so well at this church, the, the elders and the staff, and like th- they do so much for us that we don't ever see, and yet receive so little. I mean, we, we honor them just, uh, we do, we do. But I'm saying but for all of the work that they do, they, they, re- they oh, they are so much wor- more worthy of honor. Like, and by the way, I'm not on staff. I, I'm like an adjunct preacher, so I'm not asking for this for myself. But for them, they, oh, they, they work so hard for us. They love us so well. They give and pour out more than we could ever imagine. Imagine what, what it would be to take these people and hold them up publicly and say, oh, you are worth something to us. Now, even as I say that, I, I would imagine that everybody listening to me right now would agree with that. I mean, if you're a Christian, yes, we, we honor what is honorable, of course. But there's also something, if I had to guess, at least in some of us, that causes sorrow and fear. And that is, if we became the kind of community that was honoring those who are honorable, would they say anything about me? I'm not sure. You know, I, I look at the, the, the passages here. I, I look at Jesus uh, in his humility, and, and I don't know that I, I conform to that. I don't know that I have achieved such honor. And here's where I tell you that there is an ascribed honor that belongs to us that no, achieved, that no achievement or lack of achievement could ever touch. Like, think about the parable of the prodigal son. And and if you understand the honor-shame system, this parable will make much more sense. So here's this father, uh, wealthy, uh, 
and therefore honorable in his community, and his son decides that he wants his share of the inheritance early, which is essentially saying, I wish you were dead now. Give me my share of the inheritance. And so this son brings shame on himself, brings shame on his family, and he goes off and squanders all of his father's money, all of his inheritance, on wild and riotous living. And there in the far country, he is now as he has lost everything, he is feeding pigs, and it says that he came to himself, and he realizes, I shouldn't be here, I should be back in my father's household. But he knows enough to know in this honor-shame culture that he cannot return to his father as a son. That's what honor and shame means. And so his plan is to come back as a slave. That would be the fitting response for somebody who has brought shame onto their family. And so he returns under the cloud of shame, ready to be not a son, but a slave. And then what does the father do? The father sees him far off and he runs to his son, who the son who has heaped shame on his family, heaped shame on himself, has sullied the good name of the father. And the father showers him with every symbol of honor that he possesses. He puts a robe on him. He puts the family ring on his finger. He kills the fattened calf. All of these um, all these accoutrements of honor he bestows on this son who deserves nothing but shame. And that's where, that's where Jesus teaches us that the honor that the Father has to give to us, not the achieved honor, but the ascribed honor, that honor comes to us by grace. It, it comes to us by mercy and forgiveness. And therefore, it is untouchable by the achievements we make or the achievements we fail to make. And so, all this to say, when we think about our community, when we think about those who are honorable, when, when we move in the directions of honoring and obey the command of Paul here to honor those who are honorable, you need to realize that we are drawing from a well of honor whose depth you can never reach the bottom of. Like, in, in an honor-shame culture, the, the way they think about honor is that it is a limited resource, sort of like a pie. Like, if I'm going to have a bigger slice of the pie, that means somebody's going to have a lesser slice of the pie. But when we start bestowing honor, we are drawing from a well that is without bottom. And there's one more step to go. There's one more step to go. Now, if we go to uh, 1 Peter, the letter that he wrote uh, to a church, um, in chapter 1, listen to what he says. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. He says, In this, your salvation, you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, though it perishes, excuse me, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found, listen, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, it's very easy to miss this, so pay attention. He says that your faith, it's being grieved and you're being grieved right now by various trials. That faith at the revelation of Jesus Christ will be found. Okay, so the passive verb there is very important. Will be found to result in praise and glory and honor. Now, when we hear that, we immediately think, oh, well, at the revelation of Jesus Christ, we will be the ones who are praising and glorifying and honoring God. And that's true. We absolutely will. M many passages attest to that. But that's not what Peter is saying here. He's saying that our faith will be found by someone else to result in praise and glory and honor. We, in that day, will receive praise and glory and honor from the Father himself. Remember what Jesus says when he tells the parable of the end times. He says to all the people who belong to him, well done. There's the commendation. There's the honor. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. So there are people around us, people who live in obscurity, people who serve and pour themselves out, people who are even in, in front of us all who pour themselves out, and they are worthy of honor. 
And we need never fear that by honoring them, we are, we are somehow diminishing uh, our own chance at it because there is coming a day when the Lord Jesus himself will turn his beautiful gaze upon us and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Amen and amen.